Welcome back to Kingston Now. Holly Shelowitz is a culinary nutrition counselor and real food educator. For over 15 years through client sessions, cooking classes, and educational events, Holly's been inspiring people to get into their kitchens and cook. Welcome to the show, Holly. <laughs> Thank you. Now, a, a nutritional counselor and a real food educator. Mm -hmm. Tell me about those. So there's food and there's real food. And as a nutrition educator, I love to help people understand how to find a way of eating that really works well for their body. And in these busy times that we're in, a lot of people are eating out a lot and forget about veggies or other nutrient dense foods to add into their diets. And as a real food educator, I, I help to inspire people to just how to incorporate nourishing healthy foods every day, even if you are eating out, that there are certain ways to order, but really, my mission is to get people in the kitchen. Now, I've actually seen images of you in supermarkets with uh, a, a workshop in tow. Absolutely. And is I mean, it's that's you know you're really on the front lines, and you're set you know so it's like processed cheese, Velveeta, <laughs> not real food, <laughs> vegetables, real food. Yes, right? and, and not necess and yes, definitely vegetables, and it's not necessarily only vegetarian or vegan per se, but it is about eating real foods in their natural state. And, and when you say natural state, you mean no processing, no treatment whatsoever? Well, processing is such a funny word, right? So it can be, I would say when I say real foods in their natural state, certainly anything out of the garden, anything from our local farmer's markets. Of course, there are some processing involved, like if you buy a can of beans, that's technically processed, but it's still a whole food. So the process part, I think, gets people confused. It's more about keeping it simple and keeping it whole. How real is the possibility of people eating mostly real food in this day and age? Mm. Thankfully, I think, it's real. I think it's really possible because people are not feeling well and they're realizing how what they eat directly affects how they feel. And whether it's because they're ill or everyone has had the experience of eating something and either getting a headache or a stomach ache right away. Certainly sugar has that impact, although you know we're all hooked into sugar. So I'm, I'm not suggesting that sugar is, is terrible, but I am saying that um, it's really easy to know when you decide to, to tune in to see how you feel when you're eating a certain way. How much of people's relationship with food do you address in some of your nutritional counseling sessions? You know, people eat when they're sad, when they're mad. Mm -hmm. They eat thoughtlessly, unconsciously. A lot. I teach something called um, understanding what you eat and understanding what you're hungry for. And so on one aspect, I teach people how to have their plate be a nutrient-dense plate as often as possible. Ideally, since we have to eat at least three times a day, at least 365 days a year, it would be really great to know how to do that in a way that really serves us. And to what you said about the emotional aspects and something that I call food as entertainment and as, um, we'll say, medication versus medicine, is uh, food isn't, isn't designed for that. Food is really designed to nourish us, and there's amazing pleasure in that nourishment and certainly the creativity that's involved in the kitchen or in choosing and in storing and preparing the foods. One of the things that I teach very specifically in my practice is a very strong focus on self-care, which means that if, if someone notices that they're eating chocolate at night, every night, like right before getting into bed, I have a number of clients that do that. It's not uncommon. And, um, but they're not really hungry for that. They're hungry for something else. I do something called dissecting cravings. So we're looking Which at- Which that is, that's a craving. Exactly. Yeah. And it could be physical, it could be emotional, and I believe that, that they can also so be- It feels so physical though. I know, <laughs> and absolutely. Right. And there are physiological cravings mm -hmm. too, which I cover a whole curriculum in my nutrition counseling practice with my clients about really understanding what food is and and why we feel a certain way and why we're particularly craving something. So for example, let's say someone craves um, sugar every day and it's not unusual to 
to have somebody really crave something sweet. A lot of times, yeah, we might be wanting something sweet, but underneath that, maybe we're not drinking enough water. Maybe we're not sleeping enough or well. And so our bodies call for energy start to look, look like a sweet craving. And a lot of times if someone's drinking coffee and drinking other kinds of stuff other than just water, most people, many people are dehydrated and they start to feel a little wonky and out of it and then reach for coffee, chocolate, or sugar during the day to like lift the energy up. And so that's a big piece of what I help to show people is to just slow down and start to identify what we're doing just out of automatic habit. I am challenged when it comes to making food, to food preparation. And, um, You're not alone. <laughs> but we're so excited because we've actually never done a cooking segment here on the show, and we're going to do that next. So hang Fantastic. out with us, okay? Definitely. This is Kingston Now. Next, we cook with Holly. Stay tuned. Welcome back to Kingston Now. We're joined again by Holly Shelowitz, a culinary nutrition counselor and real food educator. And Holly, the studio has never smelled this good before. <laughs> what are we going to make right now? We are going to saute some greens in some coconut oil with some walnuts, raisins, and a little fennel. And now would this be uh, considered a lunch dish, a dinner? It could be a, a meal if you add some more protein to it, mm -hmm. perhaps some chicken or beans or some feta cheese, then it could absolutely be a meal. Or something when you're in the mood to just have something light and green and vital. Great. Well, let's fire up that pan. Okay. And I notice that we've got the kale is already chopped and we've got the ingredients nicely set out. I don't think it would ever look like this in my kitchen, <laughs> but you're the pro. I'm the pro. So coconut oil. Yes. We are using some coconut oil today because it's, uh, it's something that people are starting to hear a lot more about. And I think it's a wonderful nourishing fat, and it also is a great oil to cook with because it has a high heat point. And um, it also adds a little bit of coconut flavor, which is nice, but mostly, um, you know, with olive oil, which we all use to saute, it's actually better to use olive oil to drizzle on your salad and to drizzle on your food and not necessarily heat it to high temperatures. That's where coconut oil is ideal. Ghee is also really nice to use in this way as well. And it's heating up nicely. And now we've got two different kinds of kale here. Yes, we have, we have curly kale, which is the most common. And I love to show people how to cook with it because a lot of times if they haven't made it before or if they've eaten it, it gets confusing. So I'm going to actually have you take the stem right out and then you can, we can cut it in really small pieces or rip it in this case. And the reason why we do that is a lot of times if you don't want to cook it for too long, the stem is a little woodier and a little more dense. And so I actually save the stems and chop them fine and add them to my soups and longer cooking things. Ah, good, good repurposing. Yes. And the other kale? And is? the other kale is lacinato kale. It's also called dinosaur kale. And because of the really nice texture, the ribby texture that it has. It's a little greener, so both, both kinds of kale are absolutely healthy and nourishing for us, but when they're, you know, the darker the better. And so for this one, the stem isn't as woody, and I just chop it really fine and add it right in. And um, I saved us some time by just taking care of it ahead of time. I'm gonna add in some garlic. Always is, a good beginning. It is. <laughs> Sense the air beautifully. That's right. Tells you something good is cooking. Yeah. And of course, you can always, you can start with some onions as well if you prefer, but garlic just really enhances the whole dish so beautifully. And it tends to burn, so we, we're only going to leave it in here for a few minutes before I add the greens to it. Okay. Oh, I can see it browning already. Yeah. So the thing about cow that a lot of people... We're all hearing about cal, right? It's all about cal, 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 which is great because it really is a truly nourishing food. And because all of these dark greens have so much nutrition, high in calcium, magnesium, zinc, and the green part is chlorophyll. And that is literally the blood of the plants that nourishes our blood. And so, in my nutrition practice with my clients and in all of my classes, I am always talking about greens because 
They're just such an important food and it's easy to not eat enough of them. And flavoring for the kale, in addition to its own natural taste, is gonna come from the other ingredients. Yes, and in fact, it definitely needs nutrition support. Mm -hmm. Whoops, one got away. <laughs> <laughs> it definitely needs nutrition, uh, excuse me, flavor. And so it's like, you know, it's like when you use spinach or any other green, they're gonna need flavor. So the garlic is in there for that. I'm gonna use a little bit of fine grain Celtic sea salt. And I really love using this particular kind of fine grain salt because it adds minerals to the food as you're, as you're eating it. The other thing about greens that are really important is to, when you're cooking them, is to just make sure to cook them well so that they're a little tender and to also make sure that they're being cut in small pieces because a lot of times, you know, if you get a piece like this on your fork, people get really turned off and scared and they'll never <laughs> eat greens again, right? I so have to eat a bush for dinner. Exactly. It's much more appetizing when it's smaller. Yeah. Than yeah. And so what goes next? So we're going to add a little bit of fennel seed, which adds a really nice um, kind of like a, a licorice flavor. And you can see all of the greens that I put in here cook down a lot. And so even though you start out with a big mountain of greens, they'll reduce and suddenly you'll be like, ah, okay, I need more. So definitely use, you can use a whole bunch or two, depending on who you're cooking for and how many people. And now we really just, you can see how it's really beginning to Indeed, yeah, it's get already, small. Yeah, and I just want to check our flame here. Great. And so I'm gonna add a little bit of chicken stock. You can use vegetable stock or even water. And this will kind of help to steam saute it. So it's gonna add, it'll allow it to start steaming, but also be sauteing it. And then at the end, we'll be finishing it off with some roasted walnuts and raisins, which make everybody happy because a lot of times if people aren't used to eating greens and they can have a slightly bitter flavor if you're not used to them. So by adding the raisins, you know, it sweetens it up. Adding the fennel, it sweetens it up. And then the toasted walnuts add great flavor and also uh, crunch. And, and time-wise, this is really not that hard to do. Preparation isn't quick. that challenging. I mean, it's something exactly. that uh, someone who is challenged in the kitchen as I am could easily do. You could easily do. And, and really, that's my mission <laughs> is to right. get, get us all into the kitchen because as healthy as we eat and as good food as we can get outside, there's something really magical about, magical and also healing about preparing our food and keeping it simple. You could see all of these ingredients are really simple. They're available everywhere. And, uh, and it, it could take under 10 minutes. And it smells great already. Great. So how about we taste this? Sounds great. I'm gonna add a couple of finishing touches to this. I really love adding toasted nuts. I'm on a, I'm on a walnut, toasted walnut bender right now. I'm just loving them. <laughs> and so we're just going to add, it really adds great flavor. And these are raisins. I'm using um, unsulfured light raisins, but you can use any raisins. You can also use apples or pears. And then once everything is ready, which is just about now, we want to, you always want to taste and make sure that they're tender so that you're not, like you said, chewing incessantly. All right, you want to be my taste tester? I'm ready. <laughs> Let me make sure to give you some good. <laughs> uh, there you go. Okay. And then right here, if you crumbled in some feta cheese mm -hmm. or some other cheese, that, that's a meal. And if you wanted to add in, if you wanted to add chicken or fish or shrimp to this, you would add it with the garlic. And then you have your meal. 15 minutes done. Oh yeah, I could eat this every day. Excellent. That's really great. <laughs> Terrific. Good. Thank you, Holly. You're very welcome.